the uh, the recent turmoil has uh, drastically changed things. I guess I would give the best example is Syria. Uh, there's been tremendous uh, emigration of professionals. Uh, the bailout uh, necessitated by oh, excuse me. Uh, the bailout necessitated by uh, personal threats, uh, by sectarian strife, by um, frictional relationships within governmental and um, the, the public and private sector. So many physicians have left the country. Uh, beyond that, there's been uh, actual physical uh, destruction of the infrastructure. Hospitals have been bombed. Uh, clinical facilities are uh, markedly limited. Medical supplies are limited. Uh, governmental authorities have been uh, unwilling, probably in some uh, cases, to extend services uh, outside their direct control. Non-governmental authorities and non-governmental organizations have been limited in crossing the border or in infiltrating medical supplies. So uh, just the physical uh, turmoil. Beyond that, there's the political uncertainty. Uh, physician leadership doesn't really know who is going to be uh, in charge of the healthcare system uh, in the short term and certainly not in the long term. So some of the interconnections for uh, patient referrals for uh, care uh, both in uh, clinical situations and hospital environments is very compromised. Okay, and uh, from a patient standpoint, what does that mean? Is, is it like still possible to see a doctor or is it just harder? Uh, to my, my best example would be the young lady that I discussed yesterday, Dr. Surian, Janine Surian, an ophthalmologist uh, who is contacted uh, currently by uh, regime uh, physician leadership and uh, by the opposition uh, physician leadership asking her to see patients in consultation. Uh, the public hospital where she worked previously has been uh, destroyed. There's a small private clinic where she can see patients uh, that need uh, care uh, beyond what she can do in her office. So her phone rings in the middle of the night and somebody says I have a ruptured globe uh, and then we need your services. And Janine reacts with uh, comfort and, uh, and walks her charges down the street and to her little office and takes care of them. But to continue the discussion about uh, our friend and colleague, Dr. Surian, uh, she was in the U.S. staying with us in Burlington, North Carolina, uh, and she had been with us about four months uh, and nobody really wanted her to go back to Aleppo. We were afraid for her safety. Her, the demand of her patients and the, certainly the interest of her family encouraged her to return. She's the principal breadwinner for the family and she has a large patient population that she felt needed her to be back uh, given the scarcity of physicians and the scarcity of resources. So uh, she returned quite a uh, horrendous bus trip from uh, Beirut into Aleppo. So th things are challenging. Uh, electricity is uh, unpredictable, and the, her capacity to give care, therefore, is, is certainly threatened. She took some medications back with her that uh, will be very important for the care of her patients. Uh, beyond this, the, the various relief organizations are uh, challenged in, pro in attempting to provide the right sort of services at the border for refugees uh, from Syria. I know of uh, facilities, camps in Lebanon, in Turkey, and in Jordan in particular, that are uh, overrun with uh, the, the Syrian population. And uh, what do you uh, believe is the most appropriate response from the international community to the situation with the instability and you know the danger to any workers who try to go there? And I mean, where do you send money, to, to whom, and how do you make sure it doesn't get to the wrong hands? And, how do you deal with the complexities from, from that standpoint? Uh, this is the reason why our government has uh, been slow to act and why there is a division of interest in the inter international community. The opposition is uh, multifaceted. Uh, the opposition has uh, different interests and it's been very difficult for them to come to common ground. Uh, the various forces uh, considered opposition would include the Free Syrian Army, those that uh, essentially deserted uh, from the Syrian military, 
uh, to respond. The original rebels, who uh, the original opposition that seemed to be rising up against uh, inequity, uh, maldistribution of resource, and had uh, fundamentally some social uh, claims. The other elements would be the expatriate community that now rallying around a cause that they may have left the country about many years ago are coming back and trying to become leaders of this uh, multifactorial entity. And then there are some radical elements, uh, what I would call more fundamentalists, uh, those related to Al-Qaeda, Iraq, and some of the other branches of Al-Qaeda and who have a different interest in the outcome. So when one says uh, help the opposition uh, against the regime, uh, which opposition are you talking about? That's the, the challenging question. And I won't get into no-fly zones. Uh, the Russian uh, and Iranian forces that have implemented uh, the Syrian uh, regime uh, probably have a fairly sophisticated air defense system. And if we start losing aircraft and pilots, uh, that's going to bring another element to the game that nobody really wants. To your question about how to channel resources, uh, I know several organizations, I'll mention one in particular, International Medical Corps has a very active uh, facility uh, and a support base uh, on two fronts, both uh, in Jordan, on the border, and in Lebanon. And an organization like International Medical Corps, in my mind, would be a good uh, a good one to support in the cause. Uh, they do sustaining support, they do public health, they do community medicine for uh, a variety of uh, refugee uh, conditions. And I guess on the more positive side, what uh, do you see uh, happening uh, that's, uh, uh, that's promising in, in the Middle East? Sure, uh, most promising. Uh, and it's, I think I was uh, even excited to be here at uh, Unite for Sight to see uh, the ebullience, I guess, and the, uh, the energy in the young uh, population. The next generation is here full force. Uh, most of the people here are about one-third my age. And the other very interesting fact is that at least two-thirds, maybe three-quarters, are women. And I do believe it's because public health and women have a natural attraction. And, and the young uh, woman student uh, at a university or in a medical uh, preparatory program, whether it's uh, the field of medicine directly or allied health, uh, seems to be much more concerned about the elements of public health. So I'm excited to see the next generation here. I'm excited to see a, a very uh, encouraging relationship between some mentor-like figures. Uh, the young people seem very interested in listening to experience and learning from uh, our, our mistakes in the past and how we've conducted public health ventures both at home and abroad and uh, hopefully the next generation will do better. Now translating that to the Middle East, one of the really encouraging things that I witnessed in Iraq uh, really over almost 10 years now is the uh, transformation of the healthcare system there from a rather male dominant, uh, a very male dominant uh, non-integrated system focusing on large central hospitals to a much more uh, women in medicine uh, directed uh, healthcare system. Uh, obstetrics and gynecology probably the best example. Two young women, one Kurdish, uh, one Arab from Baghdad have uh, truly transformed the National Obstetric Gynecology Society into one that is much more inclusive, one that's much more representative. They're now members of the International Council of Obstetrics and Gynecology. They've adopted and implemented uh, clinical guidelines, clinical practice guidelines. They've adopted some uh, ethics and medicine uh, concepts and programs that are, are uh, very appropriate and I think rewarding for them and for their patients. And um, as far as like uh, maybe a, a Western or a person from the developing world, a woman, as you mentioned, that uh, seem to comprise the majority of uh, workers and uh, students in this field, who wants to uh, support the, uh, the health systems in the Middle East or even visit and volunteer or whatever, is it is it something that uh, 
that you would recommend to women, or is, are the challenges of being a woman in, in the Middle East too great for, for, for that to be an option? Uh, there are challenges. I, I think a lot of this uh, is unwarranted. Uh, in the programs that I've been involved with, where over 10 years we brought physicians to Iraq, um, we've had probably had 100 physicians total go. At least 15 of them have been women. We've had Jewish physicians in Iraq teaching and training. Uh, the, the medical profession in Iraq has been very eager to engage uh, globally. Uh, so there are, there are no restrictions. Uh, everyone's welcome. Uh, you come with an open mind and an open heart and you're willing to teach and train, uh, our colleagues will be very happy to receive you. I, and I think this is true. I couldn't say this for a personal visit to Iran. I can say this for a personal visit to Yemen. Uh, there are times and places where one should not be. Uh, and uh, that's uh, wise that you always have a sponsoring organization. The best sponsoring organization is the National Medical Association or the National Specialty Society. And your host uh, or hostess uh, physician should uh, be one of the partners to uh, make sure that your visit is rewarding and safe. Okay, one last question, uh, kind of taking off on that. Perhaps I have a misconception that, that was uh, uh, the premise of that question, that maybe it's more dangerous or more uh, intolerant than it really is. Are, is. Is that a misconception? And if so, are there any others that you'd like to correct uh, that we have here in the West? Uh, th there are certainly cultural differences, and I am not going to uh, minimize and I'm not going to deny that there's some cultural differences. Uh, I'll, I will say, and I think quite openly, that the, the adult male in the uh, Middle Eastern world has uh, a heritage of being um, superior in position. Uh, and this, w there was a carryover in the medical system. It is definitely changing, uh, and so I'm counting on the next generation of men and women to uh, resolve some of the traditional uh, gaps, if you will. Uh, women were always encouraged to practice medicine. They were never allowed to lead in medicine, and uh, that's, that's where the change is occurring.